Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. What happens when God moves? How must we respond? And how can we see a move of God that starts among us in the church go out and affect the world around us? Surely, if Jesus is changing his people, it should have an effect on the outside world. Surely, if we are being touched, it should be manifest and seen on the outside. And, and over a period of time, if we have claimed to be transformed by the thousands, by the tens of thousands, by the hundreds of thousands, by the millions, then it's natural that as our light is shining brighter, as we are being saltier, that that will have an effect on the world around us. But we need wisdom, we need purpose, we need strategy. So we seize the moment when God begins to move and pours out his spirit. And then as he moves in our lives, we seek to turn the tide of the society around us by the power of the gospel. Isaiah 55 Verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. So notice this, seek the Lord while he may be found. There are times when God is moving in unique ways. There are times when he draws near. Call on him while he is near. It could be the result of years and years of secret prayer and crying out, and suddenly you see the answer to those prayers. Just like when there's an earthquake, it seems sudden, but if we could see everything happening under the earth, we'd know it was building and building to get to a certain moment. It could be that God simply looks down and says, I have to act, I have to move, because things are falling apart. The bottom line is, there are unique times when God moves. There are seasons of visitation, and we must seize them when they come. We must take advantage of them. We must ride that wave when it comes in. Zechariah, the 10th chapter, and the first verse, it says... Ask the Lord for rain in the time of spring rain. King James said latter rain. In, in, in Israel, the Middle East, you have the fall rainy season. That's the early rain. And then the spring rainy season, that's the latter rain. And when you read in the book of Leviticus, in the book of Deuteronomy, when God gave blessings and curses, Leviticus 28 excuse me, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. One of the blessings is that you'll have rain in season. One of the curses is you will not. In other words, for the world to function, for Israel to survive, for the agricultural system to flow, you needed to have the rain at the right time. And if it didn't come, everyone could die. And yet Zechariah 10.1 says, Ask the Lord for rain at the time of spring rain. In other words, this is a time that God should be moving, but you have to ask. There is a cooperation with him, and there are times and there are seasons. The prophet Hosea spoke shortly before the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel. And he warned them in Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. Hosea 10, 12, he said, it's, it's time to seek the Lord until he comes and rains down righteousness on you. There's, a, there's an open door. There's a window of mercy. But you must grab it now before it passes and before it's too late. They did not, and it became too late. In, in Luke's gospel, the 19th chapter, where Jesus is entering Jerusalem, he weeps over the city in Luke 19. And he said, if only you had known the time of your visitation. If only you had realized that this was God's coming to you, but you didn't, and now destruction is coming. There are times and seasons, and when God begins to move, we must recognize it. It can happen in our own lives, when there's a stirring, when God wants to change us, 
And, and, if, and if we score in those moments, sometimes it can be years and years and years before they come again. Even, even this morning, just as a simple illustration, God was moving and was touching hearts. We were coming to the end of worship. But, but then there was a sense, let's just stay a little longer. Sometimes you do that and God breaks out and, and things happen, miracles happen that couldn't happen in 20 years of counseling. When God moves, we must seize the moment. During the Brownsville revival, when God began to pour out his spirit starting on Father's Day of 1995, it was right before the internet explosion and, and before smartphones and things like that. So word did not get out then as fast as it does now. Now the moment God begins moving, within minutes it's all over social media. And it can happen anywhere in the world and everyone's hearing about it and participating in it. But back then, word was trickling out little by little. I began to hear reports even though the evangelist that God used to ignite the revival, Steve Hill, was a colleague of mine, and the intensity of, of what was happening there and the intensity of life, we hadn't talked. So I began to hear reports about what was happening and how God was moving. And then there was an article a few months into it in Charisma Magazine, and Steve was asked, why did you cancel all your preaching around the world? Because he was scheduled to be in Russia, he was scheduled to be here and there, and he kept putting it off, putting it off, and then he canceled all his outside engagements. And Steve said, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized during the lifetime of the opportunity. It's a great quote. The opportunity of a lifetime must be seized during the lifetime of the opportunity. And when I heard it, I said to myself, that sounds like Leonard Ravenhill. Leonard Ravenhill, great man of God, went to be with the Lord in 1994 at the age of 87. We became close the last five years of his life. He was most famous for his book, Why Revival Tarries. But in all my life to this day, I'm, I'm 69 now, I never prayed with anyone the way he prayed. With a depth of brokenness, with a, a, a hunger and a passion beyond anything I've seen in anyone else his devotion and the burden that he carried. He did a meeting in our home not long after God connected us with about 50 people squeezed into our house when we lived in Maryland. And, and when he just finished, he sat in a chair and taught on the life of Paul. And when he was done, we were so devastated. <laughs> just he opened up the life of Paul and taught us. We were so devastated. We were on our faces weeping and crying out and wailing. I was in a meeting where he preached in January of 1990 in Anaheim with about 4,500 people present in, the, in the, the large church building where he spoke, and he couldn't finish his message. He was a frail old man. He couldn't finish his message because conviction got so deep that people were on their faces weeping and repenting over the whole building. Literally couldn't finish preaching. I, I thought that quote sounds like Leonard Ravenhill, but I never heard him say it. And Steve had also been close to Brother Len towards the end of his life. That's how Steve and I connected. So I called Len's widow, Martha, and I said, is that one of his sayings? The opportunity of a lifetime must be seized during the lifetime of the opportunity. She said, no, I, I never heard him say it. Once Steve and I connected in Brownsville, and then God called me to be part of the team there and to raise up the school of ministry, I asked him about it. He said, oh, yeah. He said not long before he had his stroke, which was September of 94, and he never came out of it, went to be with the Lord in November of 94. He said one day he just pointed his finger at me and said, Stevie, and gave that quote just spontaneously. You see, Steve had been a missionary in Argentina, and he was still preaching in, in South America and Latin America, and he would come back and tell Len Boy, we had incredible meetings, whatever country it was. I felt like God was about to break through. I felt if we stayed a little longer, we could see revival. And Len would say to him, then why are you here? If you stay a little longer and see revival, why didn't you stay? Steve, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized during the lifetime of the opportunity. In January of 2020, I was preaching in California, congregation of about 6,000, and 
large platform like this, but, but all the way across the front. And they'd asked me to, to, to bring a revival-related message before the Sunday services. So it was, it was a Friday night, and I preached on God coming as a refiner's fire. God coming as a refiner's fire. And at the end of the night, repentance broke out, and the altars were flooded with people seeking God and crying out for mercy and cleansing. And I knew that the Lord wanted to go even deeper. And I, I only do this if I really feel urged by the Lord. And I said, okay, some of you, you're not going to get free. You're not going to feel free until you come up here and take the mic and make public confession. I mean, that would have been the last thing on their mind when they walked into a church service that night. I'm going to be up at the mic making public confession. I said, we don't want you to embarrass yourself with details, but some of you need to do that. And next thing, the whole platform, long line of people standing there crying, ready to confess. I remember I give the mic to a man and standing next to him, and he goes, oh, I've been involved in doing drug ministry. He goes, I'm on drugs myself. I need help. And he starts weeping, so he's surrounded with people praying for him. I remember a boy, not even maybe 10 years old, he goes, the way I talk to my mommy and daddy, it's so wrong. And he's weeping, and then mom and dad come up and hug him. It was an intense night. And, and, and I realized something's happening, something's stirring. And, and I felt like th there's a greater hunger. I'm seeing it rising across America, little by little by little, greater desperation, greater hunger. The country's so deeply messed up, so deeply confused. But where's the hunger in the church? Where is it where God's people are broken and saying, something's wrong, there must be more. Lord, start to work in me. I was seeing the, the beginning of it. And then COVID happened. And that shook us. And then the racial tension and, and riots across America, and that shook us. And then the 2020 elections. And then January 6th, and, you know, the whole nation shaking. I remember thinking to myself, what happened to that wave? What happened to the beginning of God moving? And I realized the refiner's fire is here. The nation is being shaken. All kinds of junk. That's what happens with the refiner's fire. All kinds of junk comes up to the surface. Not just in the world, but in the church. All the failed prophecies and, and, and putting our trust in a person instead of God. I mean, the shaking came. And, and then so we had, you know, it just felt like two years of that. And as, as we got towards the end of 2022, as I was traveling... I was encountering the same thing in place after place. It happened here. It happened in Florida. It happened in Texas. It happened in Colorado. Place after place. Not because I was bringing it. I was witnessing it. That service after service, I was seeing buildings packed. I was seeing young people flooding the altar and worship. Hunger, thirst. Something was happening. And in January of last year, I got on the air my radio show, my daily show, and I said, and, and please understand, we have a wide range of people that listen and follow us. So there are those who are diehard, Pentecostal, charismatic, like that. <laughs> and, and there are people that would be very at home in a Reformed church where you didn't even say amen. And very theologically, we got the whole range you could say we have the, from the hypercritic to the hypercharismatic and everything in between. So I'm very careful in what I say because you could be in our Pentecostal charismatic circles and say just about anything and anyone would go for it and believe it. And even if none of it happens, well, praise the Lord, it felt good. <laughs> and then you could be in other circles where if the dead are raised in front of your eyes, like, no, nah, I don't believe it. There's a lot of counterfeits out there. So I've got the whole range. And I just felt it was time to say it because I knew it. And I, I got on the air and I said, I just want to say this. I've known it, but I just want to say this. The beginning of the first wave of the next revival has hit America. I said, it's in the early stages. It's just the beginning. But I want you to know the beginning of the next wave has hit it was about eight days after that that the Asbury Revival exploded. Out of the blue. And suddenly the whole nation's talking about revival. And, and, and you know, it's the subject. And 
Wilmore, Kentucky, a town of about 6,000 people, they end up on the final weekend before they shut down the meetings for the general public, they end up with 50,000 people converging in Wilmore. And I got back on the air and I said, look, I told you it has begun. It's in the early stages. And then Super Bowl Sunday, I start getting texts from pastors in all these different states. I get texts from Pastor Leah. I get texts from these other places. Dr. Brown, you won't believe what happened today. All on the same Sunday. This outpouring. Service going into, into the afternoon. Service lasting for hours. Hundreds of people responding to altar calls. I'm having pastors, mature, godly men with years and years of experience texting me. What do we do? We're completely overcome. I'm sitting in my office shaking. What do we do? We have to seize the moment when God comes. When you, when you think of, of Pentecost, Acts the second chapter, and the Holy Spirit is poured out, and, and, and tongues of fire come down, what would have happened if they said, cool, that was amazing, and just went about their business? I mean, it's unimaginable. There'd be no Bible. There'd, there'd be no church history. There'd be none of that. No, when God moved, they were waiting for it. They had been waiting for 10 days since Jesus ascended to heaven. Acts 1.14 says they were continually in prayer. They were seeking God. They were crying out. They, they knew God. You said don't leave Jerusalem until we're endued with power from on high. Luke 24.49. When we receive the Spirit, we'll receive power. Acts 1.8. We can't leave. We have a mission, but we can't go without the power of God. When he came, they grabbed it. Normal life stops because you never know when God will move like this again. You never know when you'll experience something like this. That's why during the revival, my schedule was often ministry-related activity and being in services between 80 and 100 hours a week. You, you never knew when it was going to happen again. We had people come from over 130 nations, over 300,000 different people responded to the altar calls. And to this day, when I travel around the world, people run up to me to tell me how Jesus changed them then. When God moves, you grab hold of it, and there are principles involved. I wrote the book, Seize the Moment, with 25 principles. When God moves, these are things we must take hold of. For example, Leviticus chapter 6, the priests were told the fire on the altar must not go out. The fire on the altar must not go out. One of the reasons was that this was continual devotion, continual worship, but there was another reason. When you get to Leviticus, the ninth chapter, and Aaron and his sons offer up their first sacrifices. It says fire came from the presence of the Lord and consumed the sacrifices. It would seem that the first fire on that altar was divine fire. God started the fire. When he starts the fire, don't let it go out. In your own life, when he does something, maybe you've been praying for a breakthrough. You've been crying out. And suddenly you find it easy to get up early in the morning and pray. You find it easy to fast. You find it easy to turn off the TV or put down the phone. You find it easy to, to, to be with God. Don't scorn it. Don't mess with it. Ride it because you never know what's going to happen. When God intervened in my life almost 10 years ago to, to get me off my unhealthy lifestyle and all the unhealthy foods I was eating and transforming and give me grace to eat foods that I would have paid you money not to eat. I mean, I've joked about it, but I lived it out that I would rather f face an angry, potentially violent crowd than try new foods. I lived like that for years. That wasn't just hyperbole. That was real. When I realized God was changing me, I thought, don't mess with this. Don't mess with this. When, 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 when that divine wave comes, you've got to ride it. You've got to go with it. And, and right now, it's critically important that we understand this. God has put us here in this world for such a time as this. It is by his choice and his will that we were born when we were born. Regardless of the situation of our birth, he brought us into this world. He gave us life. And it is by the will of God right now that he has us here in America, those that are here in Michigan, that he has you here for such a time as this. And as he is moving, 
and we're still in the early stages of what he's doing, we must recognize this is the moment for the church to rise up and make a difference. This is the moment where we push back against the kingdom of darkness, not through intimidation, not through anger, not through threats, not the way the world fights. We fight with different weapons, but we fight. It's a different approach. It's a different mentality. It's overcoming evil with good. It's overcoming hatred with love. It's overcoming darkness with life. With light, it's overcoming lies with truth. It's overcoming the power of the flesh with the power of the spirit. That's the way that we wage war, but we are waging war spiritually. And you know, it's easy for other generations to, to judge previous generations. Jesus addresses it in Matthew 23 with the religious hypocrites. And, and they say, oh, if we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we never would have killed the prophets. You, know, you build nice tombs for them. He says, well, you're confessing. You're the children of those who killed the prophets. But the very ones saying, we wouldn't have killed the prophets, then they want to kill Jesus. It's so easy for all of us to say, if I had lived in the days of slavery, I wouldn't have gone along with slave trade. Or if I had lived in the days of segregation. How do you know that? How do any of us know that? And because we live through crises in our own lives, we live through moral challenges in our own lives, and we're on the wrong side of them and don't realize it. We have to say, okay, this is our moment to make a difference. Now, please hear me. This is not a matter of Democrat versus Republican or, or bashing the president, but, but when we have something as blatant as what happened a little over a week ago, so grotesquely Blatant, so shouting to the world, blatant, that on what is celebrated as Good Friday by hundreds of millions of Christians around the world, so on the Christian calendar, one of the most sacred days of the year, to choose that day to announce that Sunday is Transgender Day of Visibility, and then for it to be that that Sunday of, quote, Transgender Day of Visibility is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. It, it was as loud as the administration could shout in our ears, we have a different agenda. We have a different vision. We have our cultural gospel that we're preaching. Oh, by all means, let's pray for those that struggle with gender identity confusion. Let, let's, let's offer them wholeness in Jesus. Let's love them where they are and help them to find freedom in the Lord from the inside out. Let's do that. Amen. Amen. But for it to be announced when it was, I mean, people were absolutely outraged. The good thing was, okay, here's the contrast. The, the contrast is clear. As we look around the world with care and hurt for everyone suffering in the Middle East right now, recognizing that Israeli blood and Palestinian blood are equally important in God's eyes. Recognizing that the death of a Palestinian baby is just as grievous as the death of an Israeli baby. As we watch this happen, we cannot mistake the demonic forces at work. So within hours of the Hamas massacre, you have, you have rallies supporting Hamas. That you have within a couple of days, Muslims at the Sydney Opera House in Australia chanting, gas the Jews. You have these mind-boggling things happen. You have 51% of young people surveyed in America say that Israel should be ended and given over to Hamas. We're living in crazy times, friends. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to stand? What is our response going to be? If we have generations ahead of us and Jesus doesn't return for some time, how are future generations going to look at us? Or what are our kids or grandkids going to say when their rights have been stripped away, when the things that we take for granted, they can't do anymore? And they say to us, Mom, Dad, Grandma, Grandpa, what were you doing when all this was happening? Why didn't you say something? Well, we didn't want to be controversial. Well, we didn't want to lose friends on social media. Well, we wanted people to think we were nice. We'll have all our reasons. And we just thought it would pass. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said the ultimate test of a moral society is the kind of world that it leaves to its children. As you signed up for our emails, you'll be getting announcements in the next few days about 414, April 14th, not ashamed of Jesus Day. You say, well, every day should be not ashamed of Jesus Day. Correct. 
But Esther 4.14 is the famous verse where, where Mordecai tells Esther, you've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. You better risk your life to do what's right and save your Jewish people. You've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. And as I was writing the book, The Silencing of the Lambs, I, I, I just felt the Lord stir me as preposterous as it was to rally believers together on April 14th because here's the deal. Here's the deal. There are believers all over America even in your workplace, and you don't even know who they are because they've kind of been hidden. There are believers in your college and high school classes, but you don't even know who they are because they're kind of hidden. And maybe you yourself have been a little more discreet about your testimony. This is the day when we all, in one overt way or another, be it a Jesus shirt or bringing a Bible or going out of a way to testify, just say, hey, we're here. We're all here. And once you've identified yourself, you've been outed. People at work, they know, are you willing for that to happen? It's our day to just make this proclamation. But the, the reality is, Esther 4.14, you've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. What are you going to do with the opportunity? What are you going to do with the moving of God? As God deepens things, as God stirs hearts more, what will you do with it in your own eyes? How will this translate out into touching the society? How do we go from outpouring in the church to awakening in society? How do we go from revival to reformation? Now, here's the good news. I'm preaching in a place that has been active. I'm preaching in a place that is not just saying we want to win the lost, we want to make disciples, we want to help those in need, we want to support missions around the world, but has also said we want to push back against the evil of abortion. We want to reach out to those who've had abortions and are hurting over it, but we want to stand against this evil. We want to stand against the evil proclamations of our state and make a difference. But friends, we need divine strategies. As God is moving, What's he putting in our hearts? How can we make a difference? And that's what I get into in, in the next book, Turn the Tide, How to Ignite a Cultural Awakening. And that's what God wants us to strategize with him about. How can I make a difference in the world in which I live? Many years ago, I was on my way to the airport when we lived in the Maryland, D.C. area. Heavy, heavy traffic, different times of the day. I'd been on an overseas trip and then come back. And now I was on another trip and, and I was a little tired and getting to the airport. I'm going to get there nice and early. And I run into terrible traffic, really bad traffic. And I thought, oh boy, I, I got to get there on time. And, and you know, there's a shoulder on the side of the, not supposed to go on the shoulder. I am a New Yorker, and kind of you're, you're expected to go through yellow lights in New York, you know? And I thought, well, whatever. I got to get there. I'm, I'm going out on the show. Children, don't follow this example, okay? Little children, don't listen to this part. Mommy, what's a shoulder? Just don't worry about it. So I, I pull out, and I'm making good time now because it's totally empty. <laughs> but, but I notice as I pull out that... Another woman, and at this point, I look at my rear view mirror. She seems like an older woman, and just that, the look of like more conservative. And though she didn't have purple hair and tattoos, or she pulls out behind me. I thought, wow, that's funny. I wouldn't have expected. It. Next thing, there's a whole row of cars, and we're, we're moving down there. And I thought, look, if I get stopped by police, I'll just tell them honestly, I'm, I'm sorry. I just got back from international travel and ministry. I'm trying not to miss my flights or for preaching tonight, and you know, guilty as charged. Well, then I see that there's some construction there, so i got to pull back in. So I pull in, and then I signal for this woman, hey, get a, I'll make room for you so you can pull in ahead of me so she doesn't have to navigate. So she pulls in, great. Well, we're driving a little further, and she's pointing. The side. It's open now. The shoulder's open. <laughs> so I thought to myself, that's so nice of her. But, you know, she knows I'm in a hurry. So I pull out, no sooner do I pull out, she pulls out behind me. Oh, she wanted to be there, but she wouldn't lead the way. She wouldn't lead the way. And 
many of us are just like, you're waiting for someone else to do it. What if God wants to put a strategy in your heart? What if he wants to, to give you wisdom? You're on social media. Lord, how can I use this to make a difference? You're, you're in the business world. You're in the educational world. Wherever you are, Lord, what can I do to make a difference? The world has changed negatively because people who don't know him and people who are often hostile to him have used their outlets to brainwash, to change thinking, used our educational institutions not to educate, but with a social agenda that is destructive. Where did so many kids get this idea that the Hamas terrorists that, that slaughtered men, women, and children and burned babies alive, where did they get the idea that they were the good guys? TikTok influences, among others. Lord, how can I make a difference? What can I do to be used by you? Yes, number one, in prayer, secretly going after him. Yes, number two, in living a godly life and being an example. Yes, number three, in sharing the gospel, being a witness. But is there another way? Is there something I could do? Is there a plan? Is there a strategy? There are ways I could invest my funds, Lord. What are you saying? Because change is not going to come just out there somewhere. It's going to come through you and me. Through us saying, Lord, as you're moving on the earth, don't pass me by. As you're moving on the earth, here I am. Send me. Use me. I'd like you to stand to your feet with me. Please stand. And if you just feel a stirring, you just feel God pulling on you. Everyone hopefully will say amen to what I'm saying. But some of you, there's something that you stir. You, you may know what it means. You may have no idea what it means. But if there's some stirring in you, I'm going to pray, and I just want you to come to this altar and just say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. Send me, use me. Lord, here I am. You may not know what it means. You may not have the slightest clue. You may be signing up to be a missionary to Japan or Timbuktu, or you may be signing up to raise millions of dollars for social transformation, or you may be signing up to be a martyr. We don't know. But you feel that stirring. You feel God saying, there's something I've got. There's something I want you to do. And all you're doing is responding, saying, yes, Lord, whatever it means. Could be a call to deeper intercession. Could be a call to fasting. Who knows? But Father, right now, here and all the other locations and those watching online, I know you're stirring hearts. I know you're stirring hearts. I know you're dropping plans and visions and seeds that in the days and weeks and months ahead are going to develop into world-changing ideas, Father. So here we are, your people. We say, Hineni, here we are. Send us, use us. In Jesus' name. So if God's stirring something in you and you just want to make a response, so it's not just in your seat, but saying, yes, I don't know what it means, but something's stirring. I want you to come up now, and we're just going to worship the Lord together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You don't have to know what it means. And I'm glad to see people of different, all at different ages respond. You're the ones he wants to use. It's us. It's us. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the Lord. There's no plan outside of it. Nobody else is going to do it. And if a church that loves revival and loves impacting culture, if not here, if not radiant, then who? Then where? Thank you, Jesus. Somebody's going to pick you up and transplant you into an inner city somewhere. Somebody's going to give you influence and stature right here. Anybody else? God's stirring you. You say, well, what am I signing up for? Just saying, yes, Lord. That's what you're signing up for. And I want to encourage you. Press in. Go after him in the days ahead. Lord, what is it? What are you saying? How do I do it? Anybody else? Come on up. I know there are more. Abba, Father, in the name of Jesus. And everybody through the whole place, close your eyes and just say, Lord, I'm here. I'm your son. I'm your daughter. Lord, I belong to you. I'm here to serve. I'm here to make a difference. I'm here to be used. If you haven't been right with him, this is when you say, God, forgive me. No more playing games. No more playing games. Just throughout this whole building, close your eyes. Lord God, Lord God. Just say this, say this out loud. Heavenly Father, throughout the whole building, Heavenly Father, here I am. Send me, use me. Glorify Jesus through me. Whatever the cost, whatever the consequence, here I am. Send me. Use me. Thank you, Lord.